Well, good morning, friends, wherever you are, uh, watching this online service. Uh, we greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord. We are into our fourth week of lockdown. Can you believe that? Uh, for, this is the fourth Sunday of lockdown. It, uh, I've got to be honest, it, the time seems to have flown so quickly. Uh, maybe that's because I've been so busy, but maybe for some it's been dragging on and uh, you can't wait for the lockdown to come to an end. I think, well, that's true for all of us. Uh, there's, there's just something about uh, fellowship and community, and I know that many of you may see me every day in devotions, but it's not quite the same, is it? I think we need to be around one another, and uh, I certainly miss... Uh, all of you, and uh, looking forward to, to getting back to some kind of normality whenever that's going to happen. Uh, so we just need to continue to pray into this pandemic and pray that we would be able to, to get to that place as soon as possible. Uh, friends, I want to uh, begin this morning by just reading a few verses from John chapter 21. So won't you please... Uh, if you have a, a phone or a Bible uh, near you, uh, grab it. There are a few passages we're going to look at this morning, and it's always good for us to actually uh, read it from Scripture ourselves rather than just listening to it. Uh, but if you do want to uh, look up on the screen, you can do that as well. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just so far in God's Word. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for another day of worship when we can come and focus on you and remind ourselves that even though we are in lockdown, you are not. And we thank you that you are there for us. We thank you that we can again read your Word and uh, allow your word to encourage us and to give us new insights that will draw us closer to yourself. And so just bless this time in your word together, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we read our other passage, that is from John chapter 1, it is customary after... Uh, Resurrection Sunday, the, the Sunday thereafter, to, to share on some of the encounters that uh, the disciples and others had with Jesus, uh, whether in the upper room, whether it's the two disciples that we in fact looked at last week on the road to Emmaus, or whether it is the disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee uh, as we read here in John 21. As I was looking at this passage to share on this morning, I couldn't help thinking that this story is really the end. And for us to, to truly appreciate this drama, to understand the conversations, uh, to follow the actions of those in the, the story here in John 21, we need to know what happened to bring about the story. In particular, what happened in the life of one of these disciples, the one who heads the list of grace here. He is also the one with whom we most likely relate to. For looking at him is really like looking into a mirror, isn't it? To begin our story of Peter, let me say that the writers of Scripture never blush to expose the faults and the failures of even 
the most devoted followers of God. They spare nobody. There's only one person they present as faultless. And had there been a single fault in him, they would have recorded it. And so we encounter Peter first in John chapter 1, verse 35. But before we look at Jesus' call on his life, by way of background, what do we know about Peter? Well, Peter's family lived in the city of Bethsaida, Bethsaida on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, according to John 1.44 but later moved to Capernaum, where he and his brother Andrew had a fishing business with James and John as their possible partners. Peter's father's name was John. Some versions say Jonah, according to John 1.42. He was married according to Luke 4.38, because at one stage Jesus Uh, and the disciples go to his mother-in-law's house. Even though Scripture doesn't mention it, Clement of Alexandria, a theologian and philosopher who lived around 150 to 215 AD, tells us that Peter had children. So that's a little bit about Peter. But let's look at the account that is given in John 1, verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. Now, they were speaking about John the Baptist now. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. When he's, the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning round, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what Jesus had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. May God bless his word to us this morning. And so, here we have the account of Peter's first calling. There are at least three signs in the opening account of Peter's call that suggested that he would figure prominently in the gospel. First, despite the fact that Andrew enters the story ahead of Peter, he is introduced to Simon Peter's brother, which suggests that the readers of John's Gospel would already know something about Peter. Secondly, after Andrew has stayed with Jesus for a day and become convinced that he is the Messiah, He makes his brother his first priority to reach. I often hear folks saying, if only so-and-so would become a Christian, they would make such an impact for the kingdom of God. And no doubt this was true of Andrew, because he knew how, what an amazing brother he had. Thirdly, Jesus needs only to look at Peter to know that he would be called Cephas, which translated from uh, the, the original means Peter in 142. And this is important, because Peter's actual name, given at birth, 
was Simon Barjona. And we read that in Matthew 16 that we'll be looking at next week. Which means Simon, son of Jonah. And so when Simon first heard Andrew's testimony that he had found the Messiah, knowing what we do about Peter, he probably felt a bit, it was a bit premature, if not a bit crazy. <clears throat> How could it be? It seemed so unlikely, so dangerously revolutionary. But then we read in verse 42, Jesus looks at him with the eyes of the Son of God upon him, standing fixed by that piercing, penetrating gaze that tore through every, every facade and every mask that he had. And in that moment, Simon must have experienced total, inescapable exposure. He must have felt like a worm that had been dug up out of the ground and now was helplessly lying in the sunlight. And yet, because of this experience, he would find himself believing Andrew's words. Who else but the promised one could look like that into a man's soul? Who else could have such insight into who he was even before he had met him? And then Jesus says, you are Simon. And that is when the silence as those holy eyes search the recesses of Simon's soul, are at last broken. He says, Simon, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Kephas, which when translated is Peter. The one who seems to know Simon through and through now claims the right to give him a new name. And more than that, he is declaring that he has the power to change Simon's very character. It will be transformed from the man, Simon, son of John, to the servant, Cephas, Peter, Rock, adopted son of God. Which name Jesus used to refer to Peter from then onwards depended on which nature he allowed to control his life. When he allowed his, his brash, impetuous, impulsive, over-eager actions to control his life, then Jesus usually called him Simon. For example, he was called Simon when he did not believe that Jesus could help him catch fish that we'll read about in Luke chapter 5. Or when Jesus predicted that Peter would betray him three times in Luke 22. Or in the garden of Gethsemane when he fell asleep in Mark 14. Or indeed in the passage of John 21 when Jesus restored him to his service. But when he allowed his faith in Christ to be in control, he was usually called Peter to describe the person that he would become, the rock, the future leader of the early church, which is why we've entitled this message this morning, A Journey from Simon to Peter. It is a journey every one of us is taking. I think what is always comforting for any of us who know we've been called to be Christ's disciples is that even as Peter wavered between commitment and failure, sin and righteousness, stubborn resistance and obedience, Jesus still chose him to be one of his leading disciples. The one who would one day be the, the leader of his church in Jerusalem. Like Peter, we struggle with putting off the old self that is a slave to sin, according to 
Paul in Romans 6, verse 6. To embrace that new self that is born of God. While we are fully aware that those who love God follow His commands according to Jesus' sin in John 14, remember, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I think we would all admit that all too often our thoughts, our words, and our deeds reflect our love for the world rather than our love for God. And so Peter was no different. For like Paul, for Peter and for us, there's this constant kind of battle, this, this war that is going on within our souls, fighting for our allegiance, our allegiance to, to God on the one side and our allegiance to the world on the other. And when we fall short of God's glory through our sin and our failure, as so often was the case of Peter, we often feel totally inadequate. And we believe that somehow it disqualifies us from, from being his disciples and serving in his kingdom. And yet, friends, like Peter, we dare not excuse our following of Jesus or our serving, serving him based on our sinfulness or our failure. But that we rather seek to bring every area of our lives under the, the lordship of Jesus Christ and his purpose and his call upon our lives. Now we all learnt from his earlier Sunday school that Jesus called 12 men to be his disciples, and we read that in Matthew chapter 10. However, if we read Scripture carefully, we discover that he had called a small group of them first before he selected the others to be part of his team. The first call we read about is the one that we, we read in, in John 1, 35 to 42, where Andrew and his brother John and Peter encounter Jesus. Now, we don't have time to look at the chronology that leads up to the calling of the first disciples in Luke chapter 5. But there are a number of events that take place before we can reach the, the incident that we read of in Luke 5, 1 to 11. You see, after the initial group that I mentioned believed in Jesus, they followed Jesus from the Jordan River over to Cana in Galilee, where Jesus turned water into wine in John 2, 1 to 12. And then they followed him down to Jerusalem where he cleansed the temple and he shared in the Passover feast, and they watched him perform many miraculous signs that are described in John 2, 13 to 25. And then they followed him back via Samaria, where, of course, he met the woman uh, by the well. And then the small group of men, Peter, Andrew, John, and possibly James, left him and went home to Capernaum. Now, we do not know why they left him. We just know that they left him. And while they were in Capernaum, Jesus went to Cana, where he responded to a court official's request to heal his son. Now, interestingly, Luke places that healing event after the calling of the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Matthew and Mark say that it happened before. It doesn't really matter. It's not of any significance. Then Jesus left for Nazareth. And we know that he went to Nazareth. He wasn't received very favorably. He was rejected by his family, his friends, and the elders. The next chronological event is the one that we find in Mark 4, 18 to 22, uh, rather, Matthew 4, 18 to 22, Mark chapter 1, 16 to 20, and then the one 
that I'd like you to turn to in Luke chapter 5. Or again, just follow the text up on the screen. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, many have suggested that the account in Luke differs so much to the one in Mark and Matthew that it actually refers to a separate event. Now, I don't believe there's enough evidence to support that view. Yes, the details of both accounts are quite different, but often in the Gospels, we find that different writers present their accounts in such a way as to make a particular point, especially with their audience in mind. We know, for example, that Matthew's gospel was written primarily to Jews, whereas Luke's gospel was written to Gentiles. We also know, as an example, that John places the cleansing of the temple by Jesus right at the start of his gospel. And one would assume at the start of his ministry. Whereas the synoptic gospel writers place that story right at the end of their gospel. Now that doesn't mean to say that those were two separate events. It simply means that John placed his version or his account of the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of his gospel for a very specific purpose that we don't have time to go into now. My only point is that these are not necessarily separate events. It's highly unlikely that they would be. As we said earlier, we do not know why the disciples left Jesus the first time. But it seems that Jesus came after them. Luke's account gives us far more detail than both Mark and and Matthew. We find Jesus standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, or the Lake of Gennesaret, surrounded by a crowd of people. Technically, Luke is correct in his designation, because the Sea of Galilee was a lake and not a sea, since uh, the body of water is not connected to any ocean. And then he saw two boats lying on the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and they were washing their nets. 
And so Jesus sees these two empty boats on the shore when he arrives. Now this is different from Mark and Matthew's account who say that Peter and Andrew were casting nets into the water and James and John were repairing their nets. Luke says they are here washing their nets. And then Jesus got into Simon Peter's boat and asked him to move the boat away from the shore so that he could teach the crowd and use the boat, in a sense, as a pulpit. When Jesus had finished teaching, he commanded Peter to move the boat further out into deep water and to start fishing, in verse 4. But Peter objected to Jesus' request. He explained that he had been fishing all night and caught absolutely nothing. And after all, Peter was a fisherman And this guy was a rabbi, and what do rabbis know about fishing? So he wasn't about to listen to someone who knew pretty much nothing about fishing. And so when Jesus commanded him to drop the nets and fish in the deep part of the water, Peter could hardly believe it. But notice that Peter responded with the words, Master, Master. In other words, Peter recognized who Jesus was. And then we read that he obeyed what Jesus had asked him. And when they had done this, they caught this great quantity of fish, so much so that their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. Now, this was a a fisherman's dream catch. Talk about catching the largest fish. Peter had just made the biggest catch of his career. How would you feel if you were Peter? This should never have happened, according to Peter. Because he, as a fisherman, had been fishing all night. He knew where to fish and how to fish. He wasn't an amateur. So how did he feel when someone who he thought knew nothing about fishing tells him to go to a certain place and suddenly he catches so many fish that he had never done before? How would you have felt? But when he saw that he fell down at Jesus' feet. And what did he say? Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. What had just occurred was a miracle, and Peter knew it. Jesus had performed a real miracle. And how did Peter respond? Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Go away. These are not the words of someone who's elated, someone who has just caught the biggest catch he's probably ever caught in his life. Peter had not said this before when Jesus preached, or he taught, or he did miracles. But this time, Jesus had performed a miracle that Peter really understood. It was within his realm of expertise. It was on his turf, and he was both stunned and afraid at the same time. Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. The Jews knew only a righteous man could perform such a miracle, according to John 9, 15 to 16. And Peter recognized that he was a sinner. Peter now understood who he was for the first time and who Jesus was. He was a sinner and Jesus was not. And he understood that Jesus, in fact, was the professional and he was the amateur. 
Jesus was the teacher and he was the student. And Peter understood that Jesus was way above him. He was Lord. He says, go away from me, Lord. What an amazing declaration. The next part of the passage tells us that James and John were amazed too, in verse 9. They were all amazed, and they were afraid of Jesus. Why were they afraid? Because they now understood who it was who was calling them, and they recognized his authority. And so Jesus comforts them and says, Do not be afraid. But he doesn't stop there. He then goes on to say, from now on, you will be fishing for men or for people. Jesus' message was simple. If we want to serve him, we must start with him. Jesus said that we are to follow first. And once we start following, then we can serve. The Greek word for follow literally means to follow from behind. And we all know that in those days, a rabbi would have a protege, like a student, and the student would have to follow the rabbi everywhere he went he would do exactly what the rabbi did. He would say the same words. He would respond to situations in the same way. And so Jesus was calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John to, to physically follow him, to physically walk with him, to go where he went, to do what he did, to say what he said. And to do that, they would need to commit themselves wholeheartedly to be with him before they could serve the kingdom of God. Their daily routine would have to become that of Jesus. Jesus had called them to abandon their own wishes. But they hadn't done that before. After the first calling, it's clear that Peter... James and John and Andrew went back to fishing. Now they understood that this is what was required to follow Jesus. And that is why we read that when they brought their boats to land, they left everything to follow him. Friends, Scripture teaches us that there are different levels of commitment. On one occasion in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus told his disciples that if they wanted to be great in the kingdom of God, they needed to be servants. If they wanted to be first in the kingdom, they would need to be slaves. And Jesus said that we have two choices. We need to be servants or slaves. Paul the Apostle called himself a bondservant. There are different levels of commitment. At the first call, these few disciples believed. But then the obedience was tested. And at the second call, Jesus commanded them to follow him, to leave everything, and to be fishers of, of people. And they left everything to do that. So my question as we close this morning is, is God calling you? And at what level are you prepared to commit your life to Him? 
He is not wanting our objections. Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. He is wanting our submission and our commitment and obedience. But I will do as you say and let down the nets. Are you following Jesus? I fear that today there are so many people who are following Jesus. But really, He has no claim over their lives. They would be the first ones to say, no, we follow Him, we go to church, we read our Bible, we pray. But a true disciple, remember what Jesus said, that if you want to follow me, if you truly want to be my disciple, take up your cross. And taking up your cross literally meant to give up everything. Now, I don't think the Lord is wanting us to give up our jobs and homes and any material thing we possess. But I think it is giving up our own will to Him. Not my will, but yours, Lord, be done. And being prepared to be bond servants, slaves, for the sake of the kingdom. And so for some of us, we may have heard that first call. And even recognize who Jesus might be. But maybe God is coming back to you today as he came back to Peter, Andrew, and John to say following me is more than just lip service. Following me is more than just going through a whole lot of rituals and just doing, living your life as you please and in your spare time following me. Following me is total surrender. Now go and make disciples. Go and be fishers of men and women. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your call upon our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you do not call us to be sensations, but call us to be bond servants, slaves, who submit our will to yours. And even though you first called Andrew and Peter and John, they recognized who you were, they pretty much continued their lives as they normally did. They heard you teach, they saw you perform miracles, and yet they went back to their fishing. And then you came to them again on that shore. And through the miracle that you performed, you made them recognize who you really were. That you are God who calls us. That we are called to take up our cross and to follow you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to submit ourselves to your authority to submit ourselves to your will, to your purpose, and to your call. That we would not just continue to live our lives as we pleased, but that we would live the lives that you want us to live, that would expand and grow your kingdom. 
And that is why you call us to go and make disciples and to be fishers of both men and women so that they too may follow you and then serve you. Help us, Lord, to be your true disciples. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you all on this wonderful Sabbath day, and we pray that you would have a, a wonderful day with your family, if you're with family or friends. And uh, we will catch up with you again. I know it's one directional, but uh, we'll catch up with you again tomorrow morning. And for those of you who follow our online services, we look forward to being with you again next Sunday. Amen. Friends, as you all know, our financial obligations as a church during this time of lockdown have have not uh, changed uh, significantly, uh, and we may not be able to take up a physical free will offering at our service, but we do encourage you to continue to pay your tithes either by EFT or using uh, our snap scan facility that we have set up for your convenience. If you want to know more about snap scan, which is particularly useful in in making one-off donations, especially to uh, projects, for example, our filler bag project, uh, please go to our website where it is fully explained. Uh, international donors will also find our swift details there as well. For those of you who would like to make a donation now as part of this act of worship, uh, we'd invite you to do that, uh, and you'll, in a moment... Uh, our SnapScan uh, code, QR code, will, will appear on the screen and you can either make use of that or you can do an EFT uh, payment. Uh, we thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your prayers at this time and we continue to, to lift up, especially the many in our community are in need. And uh, if you can make a contribution towards our food parcels, uh, as has been requested, we, we ask you to do that as well. God bless you all.